Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Joining me on this goddamn double feature is uh, Michael Kester. My name is Eric Lord Ingram. Humongous. And yeah, you want to be humongous for no, this show? You can be Lord Humongous. Oh, that's weird. And um, I'm not going to call myself Lord Humongous. It just but you're sounds fucking like Lord I'm Humongous, man. Inviting. All right, so the movies we're doing today. <laughs> Uh, what are the movies? Today we're doing Bellflower and of Crash. We there we are. Bellflower and Crash. Those yeah. were the movies, yes. The David Cronenberg Crash. The Dave and the Evan Gladell Bellflower. There you have it. Uh, we're going to... Chapters. Wait, let's do this correctly this okay. time. <laughs> Use chapters to skip the rest of this boring segment. There. You like that? I'm on top of this. This is going to be a good show. I can tell already. <laughs> You can use the chapters. They're embedded in the show. The reason you might want to use the chapters if you haven't skipped yet, this is going to be like a secret segment that no one hears because uh -huh. everyone went, ooh, yeah. chapters, skip. Right. Um, you can skip over the spoilers using yeah. the chapters. And Bellflower, I know we always kind of do this thing where we talk about the level of spoilerage that you can actually do. Yeah, that's my and fault. And I think that's Sorry stupid. That. Not, yeah, I don't is, think you're stupid. No, I I'm think, stupid as well. Um, but coincidentally, not But really what I do want to say is Bellflower has one of my favorite spoilers. Oh, good. Okay. Um, of any film ever and uh so we're definitely going to talk about that well here's what we're going to do we're going to do bellflower first and just to say fuck you to all those people who skipped the spoiler warning using the chapters gonna feature spoil it right away yeah what's the spoiler from uh, bellflower tell me right now my favorite spoiler from bellflower is when he fucking wakes up after that massive slaughter fest uh -huh. and it, he kind of just goes okay so don't burn the box. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. All right, so where should we actually start with Bellflower? I think with Bellflower, you got to start before they make the film. Oscilloscope? Is I that what you, you want to talk about? I think you start Productions. Of course you do. So tell me about this. So Oscilloscope Productions, they're, I mean, you've seen the logo if you've yeah. ever watched a film. If you've watched this film, sure. maybe. Um, and it's, uh, it's an independent film production studio. They do a lot of um, stuff at Cannes and... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sundance, that's the other one. Those are the sure. two that people give a shit about, right? Yes. Um, Man, this is going to be like the indie circuit show. Oh, We're yeah. We're going to be talking about that a lot. And uh, and it's it was run by Adam, I don't know how to pronounce it, Yach or Yach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know um, who you're talking about. From MCA. I pr yeah. I've always called him MCA, that's and fine. then he died. And yeah. then when you say MCA, people... You have to call him Adam Yach. Sure. So, MCA, so where else will people know him from? The Beastie Boys from Futurama right. is where people will know him from. <laughs> sure. Um, but he sure. was, uh, yeah, he was MCA in the Beastie Boys. And uh, he had this side project with all of his massive amounts of well-deserved cash from being an innovative musician and musical artist. No sarcasm there, by yeah, the way, none. right? Okay, good. Um, totally on board with you. And, I just uh, want to make sure we are yeah, clear for the yeah, audience. Absolutely one of Hooray the most Hooray Capitalism. Yeah. Did a good job. Groundbreaking. Got lots of money. Sure. And then used it on art. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, so Oscilloscope Films was, it's this production company that funds independent films that, you know, are interesting or innovative. Sure. Um, and, As an uh, alternative to just buying a giant gold pyramid, perhaps? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay, so a uh, film company. Right, and uh, and Bellflower was one of the films that, uh, I think it was one of the, the last films Oscilloscope ever put out. Sure. Um, it came out in 2011, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, I mean, man, one of my favorite films, I think, in the entire world. Awesome, awesome. Um, and uh, you start there. So you start with this uh, independent film company, giving this first off director a chance, this sure. writer, producer, director, star, you know, one of our favorite types of people. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it's Evan Gladell who plays, um, who plays Woodrow in Bellflower. Mm -hmm. And, uh, on top of making the film, he goes ahead and builds a camera. Sure. Builds a fucking camera for sure. the film. And he put the car together. They actually made yeah. that car themselves. Yeah. Um, you can actually buy one. I don't know if you know this. Oh, I did not if know If you that. give them $500,000, they will build you a Mother Medusa car. Really? And For they a mere $500,000? Yeah, and they will get all the permits, and they will make wow. it street valid. It will be able to shoot fire, and they will deliver it to you. And the $500,000 you know, bonus for them is so that they can produce more films. 
as a point of comparison, you can buy Tony Stark's car for two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, it's an obscene amount of maybe a hundred and twenty thousand um, yeah. dollars, depending on your options. It's an absolutely obscene amount of money, but oh, it's uh, the whole idea is sure, sure. To produce their film yeah, as definitely. much as get a sweet ass motherfucking car yeah, sure. designed by a filmmaker. I mean, this guy does everything. Well, yeah, I wanted to talk about this camera, first of all. Um the uh it's this kind of camera that I guess he hodgepodge put together. Yeah. That is his, you know, it's his baby. It's what he makes his movies with. Mm-hmm. So in being a guy who's so invested in kind of gadgets and yeah. do it yourself and building, he created this camera and you know, I as a person myself who likes cameras, I like to think a director has one camera. It's their baby. They carry it everywhere. Sure. They make their it's their partner in filmmaking. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's fucking Keith Richards' guitar. Yeah. I think of it, you know, like the little musical background I have where you have your guitar, you're married to it, it writes all your songs yep. with you. You take it places and make your art. But that's not true. Cameras are disposable. You rent them. They cost a lot of money. Right. Most of the time you don't even operate them. You have a uh-huh. fucking camera operator. You play guitar and look through them. But this is a guy who uh, built his, he's, he's a fucking Jedi building his yeah, lightsaber. That's absolutely. what this is. So you actually, and this is a rare moment for a show. I think you might know more about this crazy camera thing than I do. Yeah, I, I got really excited when I first saw sure, Bellflower. Sure. And I did a whole bunch of looking into, I mean, the first thing that you and I ever do when we see a film. Uh, Read that we everything like, possible yeah, about it. I mean, yeah. uh, I believe the most exemplary moment was Ty West. We saw (laughs) House of the Devil and immediately went, must see everything. Sure, yeah. Apparently, except uh, him at Music Box. Yeah, sorry about that, Way to go, us. Um, (laughs) But I watched Bellflower, and I went online, and I read every fucking thing there was to to know about Evan Gladell and the whole rig that he used to make the film. Awesome. And the camera is composed of old Russian camera lenses. Cool. And from so way back. So the dirty, grungy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, great. And then uh, a bellows from an old photography camera. You know, um, smile, poof. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah put right. your head under the hood. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of those bellows. And uh, the whole, it's, I mean, it's insanely DIY. And it's very manual. Cool. Um, but it's it's those two on top of just, you know, a digital camera, which I'm sure you know more about than me. It's the SI2K, isn't okay. it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. See, I didn't know how much of that 2K is actually under that body. The there. operating parts. Okay. Well, the SI 2K is if you think so, we talk about red cams, and um, uh, I'm looking down at the camera that's in our. St- what is this thing? Uh, Canon. The yeah. the T3i. You know the DSLR filmmaking stuff. Where the red cam is kind of the, I guess the Mac of the camera world. Yeah. The uh, the SI two K would be all of that SI stuff. It's kind of the Linux end of that. Oh, it's the thing you could pull apart and build. First of all, the camera has Wi Fi, so there's that. Huh. Yeah, it'll record in RAW. I think it does H two six four stuff. But two K, um, two K is a term that basically means it's like how the red shoots four K. Uh huh. You're familiar with the ten eighty p. Yeah. So you sure. know high definition seven twenty p ten eighty p video. The T3i we have here will shoot 1080p. The RED camera will shoot 4K, which is, you know, 4,000 by whatever resolution. It's huge. So it's a little more future-proof. Uh, when people eventually have 4K televisions that right. can, you know, hold their, like, retina televisions or whatever, mm-hmm. then we'll be able to get really great definition. So it's making sure we film a movie now. We don't even really have displays where we could see how awesome this is, except maybe on, you know, the greatest possible computer displays. Yeah. But in the future, when stuff is better, as it will always be in the future, then this will still look good. Sure. So this is a 2K camera. So it's about twice the definition or whatever of 1080p. And it has Wi-Fi. It's got a fucking, it's got a Core 2 Duo in it. It has, you know, a MacBook processor or whatever in it. And, uh, and they're known for being, they're about the same price, so it's not necessarily cheaper, but they're just, they're super low noise and they're very, people into that kind of do-it-yourself, hodgepodge your Russian lens on there. You yeah. know, I could totally see where he's, uh, he's using one of these things. Sure. So that's the makeup of the film before right. we actually get into fucking Bellflower. Sure. Um, but I think that that's a huge part sure. of what makes Bellflower such an interesting and unique film. Definitely. Is that it doesn't look like anything yeah, i've ever right. seen before and that's not always to say that that's better or worse we always talk about on the show how you can do something 
that everyone has done and by simply knowing people have done it you can tweak it and show that it can be done that way but well right um when people think about you know on their cell phones they use instagram or whatever yeah they apply filters to their photos the things that instagram is calling back to that's the kind of equipment that he's actually built yeah, here exactly he has a a movie and um you know we'll have a kind of a connection i want to talk about mumblecore a little bit uh we've never discussed that yeah on the show but um, in talking about that cultural thing that has happened with photography, where people have a, a huge interest in making photos look like the old timey stuff, mm -hmm. making these lo-fi movies and then using these dirty Russian lenses and the right. speed up. Uh, I love that because they're Russian, they're dirty. Yeah, that's well, just, that's not that well, Russian I mean, people I think are about dirty. The old Russian sci-fi stuff. Sure, you think about old you know? Russian sci-fi. You think yeah. about yeah, absolutely. Well, I think about Metropolis. Uh, well, you want to think about old Russian sci-fi. I think about Christmas from Mars again. Yeah, yeah. And then sure. I think, well, dirty. You the know, the original Solaris. I mean, have you seen that shit? No, it's I haven't. Gritty. Is it dirty? Yeah, gritty, gritty stuff. So the the marriage that I think we're seeing here, and I don't have a lot of background because I'm not a big fan of this mumblecore thing, but. Part of it is the Mad Max stuff, and part of it's the Mumblecore stuff. That's the narrative I'm going to create for okay. a conversation, Yeah, and it could just be completely made up. Great. I don't know. But there was this thing that happened. Let's uh, You and I know the Mad Max stuff back and forth, yeah. so we'll talk about that a sure. ton. But I want to talk a little bit about the Mumblecore thing, probably because I'm being so dismissive of it, I imagine it'll never show up again. Uh -huh. Double feature. Is Mumblecore Guy Ritchie? <laughs> Mumblecore because <laughs> I'm just imagining that's what you want it to be that's what right? I'm thinking I'm thinking Mumblecore must be those Guy Ritchie movies Mumblecore is this it's a really annoying term and uh -huh. everyone hates it and it went away pretty quick it was these movies that were made for about three years honestly that uh that made a, a huge uh round in the indie circuit and we're getting a lot of press at film festivals to you know Mumblecore describes something that's existed for a long time it's something that Linklater was really big for doing. It's something that um, when it was kind of done in primer, it was done so well, people didn't consider it mumblecore. Wow, this is like a big reveal for me at it's this point. It's independent filmmaking is what I'm getting at. Are you kidding? It's, no. I mean, yes and no. It's more specific than that. Okay. But I, let's reel it in a little bit. I'll give All you right. a more specific idea. Because is when people just walk around and chat and then <laughs> that's a movie? I think you've got it, really? actually. <laughs> yeah, well, it's so it's these movies that have, we'll go over some details, right? Impossibly small budget. Uh -huh. I guess that's Gus one Van thing. Gus Van Sant directing. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's even small. It's people you've never heard of. Uh -huh. Let's start there. Okay. People you've never heard of making impossibly small budget films using non-traditional actors. Uh -huh. It's a lot of backyard films. So it's stuff that's, they're super talky by nature. Sure. Probably because that lends itself to the okay. budget. So now I'm thinking something like kids- it's Something a little like closer maybe to that. girlfriend exactly. experience. Sure, sure. Again, without the massive names. And right. I say massive very loosely. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the sure, massive right. names of Sasha Gray and Chloe Savini. Yeah, I mean that Soderbergh direction, that's a good, you know, a good way to kind of think about that. Kids, I think, is a great example of had the whole thing that happened surrounding kids happened four years ago, yeah. then people might have gone, oh, this is a piece of mumblecore <laughs> filmmaking. The Linklater stuff, the early uh, kind of stuff that made the festival circuit. Days and Confused. When he was, I mean, I'm even thinking like the slacker kind of stuff. Oh, or, oh yeah, right on. But it's the just, actual ones. It's yeah. lo-fi, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's that um, it really often imitates life. Uh -huh. And that's what I mean when I say a backyard film. They're almost kind of hangout films. Sure. They're often really improvised. Not all the time, but yeah. very often. And the idea is just, uh, in the same way as a lot of the filmmakers, the bigger filmmakers you mentioned, like Soderbergh, to give natural performances, sure. to have everything look really authentic and just, yeah. you know, this is what life yeah. looks like. Well, and I think that that's something Bellflower does in spades, is it, it kind does. of has it this does. perpetuating humanity sure. to all of the characters, for better or for worse. I mean, it does this thing where you have... Woodrow and he seems like a cute guy but he's also kind of fucking annoying sure um, right he's a little bit too much of a pussy sometimes you got but, it but uh you know you still you get him more than like him or identify with him sure you know him yeah by the well, end of these the film, are I mean these are also people that you know are our age sure we right. don't you and I I don't I don't know why I don't want to say it's because we're more awesome than everyone but I think we came from strange backgrounds yeah so we don't look a lot like other people are yeah, it's true you know what i mean yeah we don't fall into that social scene 
And I don't want to... It was the social scene of normal looking people. Well, that's it, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to make it sound like... I'm kind of trying to say I'm so unique and cool uh-huh. and awesome, but it's really because I have no friends. Maybe right. that's yeah, what that's I'm what I, I was. Ju- that was actually the joke I was going to make. Like, I you... don't know where your background comes from, but I was nuts, and no that's why I don't... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, my background comes from being a fat nerdy kid. <laughs> cool. I grew up the fat nerdy awesome. unpopular kid for 14 years. Well, and you and I don't drink. I think yeah. that's maybe the other thing. But this... um. This kind of culture is a lot of what mumblecore is. It's these um, these kids who are in their twenties. You know, this uh, this happenstance genre is kind of littered with people that it it represents how people feel in their lives. They have, um, you know, what are you doing with your life? That's yeah, basically sure. the general feeling of you're twenty. Maybe you have no job. You're living in a really low rent apartment. You get together with all your friends all the yeah. time with your red go to a bar and eat crickets. Red plastic cup. Or yeah, you do the exhibitionist, you know. Yeah. But the thing that separates this movie and pushes it uh away from the the other mumblecore stuff is that it has this strong Mad Max element to yeah. it. It doesn't just wander around and go, Oh, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I need comfort in how aimless things are. Well, I think it that, builds fucking cars. Well, but I, see, that's the thing is, I think it. I think it does do that. I think it, it does that too. It goes. Yeah, I mean, what are we doing? Like, you sure, know, it, it constantly that. begs the question: What are these people doing with their lives? Who sure. are they? What's the point here? And that's where the Mad Max element comes in. Right. Is the answer is they are preparatory anarchists. Sure, they are getting ready. For the end of the world. They're yeah. preparing for Armageddon. And then that does some sort of backwards extrapolation into their own life where they end it. Yeah. You know what right, I mean? Right. They, the, the film opens with this kind of discussion about Lord Humongous and Mother Medusa. And you know what's going to fucking happen? We're going to roll up with our sure. flamethrowers. Sure. And it's this childlike being the most badass motherfucker. Sure. sure. Um, well, and they even talk, I mean, they say directly in the movie, you know, we want to roll up at a bar where people will look at us yeah, and look and we'll at our car stand against our and car go, and smoke cigarettes. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely something I can go. I'm not above that. Right. I would have that conversation. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if we made this car? Hey, let's go drive it somewhere where yeah. people will ask us about right. the car and want to be our friends. Right. And then what ends up happening is that kind of it starts in the film when the world comes to a close this is what we will be doing sure and then bad things start happening to the characters and they start feeling you know like their world is ending sure and that's when you start getting into the dangerous area of planning for the armageddon the self-fulfilling armageddon exactly yeah. when you yeah. plan for the armageddon Armageddon, it's 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 going to be one of the heaviest things i've ever said on double feature Great. i'm excited you're saying it Armageddon is totally subjective. <laughs> sure. And it's one of the only times I've ever seen that point brought up in film. I didn't realize it right. until I was watching Bellflower and you see Woodrow, who was this cute guy. I mean, sweater vest. Yeah. You know, fucking sweater vest. Sure. And I think the word you want is adorable. Yeah. And he he trades his car for a motorcycle. He gets mixed up with this girl who's a little bit too nuts for him Hot, she's nuts yeah nuts both. Is the one you wanted okay both. sorry and she she fucks him over because that's who she is you sure. know and that's again an illustration of i guess what is called mumble core um sure. where Damn it, i thought we'd said that for the last time oh well. um yeah, where, where she's this person you know like you get her sure you've met her sure. by the end of the film you've met millie yes and you hate her Right. For what she's done. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't blame her because she's a person. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. And uh, and that is all it takes for Woodrow to go, this is the end of the world. Yeah. For me, he gets hit by a car. He has no job. Right. He's got all this bad stuff happening to him. Sure. And so he goes, okay, it's fucking flamethrower time. Yeah, it right. is, it it's is the time for Lord Humongous. Sure. We well, and that's bring the, thing the is, apocalypse this you know, time. I think, oh, the end of the world... You have that fantasy idea of, oh, when that happens, which won't fucking happen. Right. But if you're a survivalist or you're into zombie movies or whatever, you have these stupid fantasies about, oh, what will it be like and how will I protect myself from the zombies? Right. And they star Mel Gibson. Yeah. <laughs> He's, you know, these guys obviously take that too far. Yeah. But the idea you have in your head is, well, when there's a mushroom cloud, then yeah. I'll know, oh, well, it's desert wasteland and there's a robot with a George Washington wig and Felicia Day's hanging out. And so you know when that's happening but they have their own mini mushroom cloud uh-huh. i mean there's the one at the end too or whatever sure. but 
when that flamethrower goes off, yep. they take a second to pause and go, I mean, it's a moment to go, wow, how boss is this right? thing we create? I didn't realize how destructive and terrifying it is. But also, there's a small little mushroom cloud. Yep. There's the moment where you kind of go, oh, the end times look like this. Not even realizing, sure. wait, I just made that. That's right. only here because I put it here. Yeah, exactly. And that's why when you get that final spiraling moment where he's staring at Millie's shit. Sure. I sure. mean, what's the, the vignette chapter is called uh, No One Gets Out of Here Alive. Or yeah, no one the gets title out alive. card. Right. I mean, by the end of that, when he's walking down the street and um the uh the other girl blows her fucking brains out yeah yeah isn't that great um that's oh, a moment where you see him his hands are covered in blood mm. fire all around him the sh the shots are dark and heavy contrast yep, yep. and blood is flying behind i mean y you don't know what he did to millie but apparently his uh his cock was actually that thing from seven <laughs> i was gonna say yeah i don't um, know what happened there but i i thought about that same fucking scene and uh seven. and by then you realize, okay, yeah, he's bringing the Armageddon. Yep. This guy's, this motherfucker is going to bring the Armageddon. Well, and it's the film also proving it isn't just the characters yeah. in the movie. Right. It's, um, that's the thing that I think makes it unlike other pieces of, I don't that even thing. want to call it a, a genre. It's like a subgenre of a sure. subgenre. But the, uh, the characters are wearing ironic shirts and stupid sunglasses. Right. The movie is not that. The movie is the Mad Max stuff. Uh-huh. And when it gets to the end, that's where it really shows, you know, it's showing off. It's that uh, it almost looks like the bleach bypass thing. I think we talked about it probably not on seven, but maybe on Fight Club. Uh -huh. Just a really heavy version of that and bloody as fuck all. And I mean, you know, the content of the movie up to this point has been what's celebrating that really Armageddon yeah. end of the world stuff. Uh -huh. They made a flamethrower and they... You know, this stuff, the filmmakers actually created the, the whiskey dispenser and yeah. that kind of stuff. That um, that great matte black car. That's also how you know it's the end of the world, I guess, sure. is you have a matte black car. Matte black, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, it's that or Fast and the Furious, I uh -huh. think, is one of the two things. I love that control panel they have, too, though. Right. It's just great. The fucking uh, LED buttons. Yeah. And, oh, God, the whole thing is great. But by getting all these things out of order, you have some of the most uh, the most celebratory moments at the end. Yeah. But you also have the, oh, fuck, what did we do yeah. kind of moments. You know, you get your, your climax gets to be all the insane stuff, all of the weaponry or the gadgets or the, you know, the blood soaked shirt and the looking crazy. But um, you actually provide some answers in the end. Mm -hmm. The very ending after the climax is the part where by showing it out of order, you get that end voiceover about fantasy and Lord Humongous. And it really informs how this happened. It's a really great note to go, you know, if you weren't making that connection yourself or you weren't sure that's what was intended, we are saying, I mean, directly to you. Oh, we have, this is time to embrace fantasy world. Yeah. We are, it's giving you real insight into nut jobs, mm -hmm. <laughs> into going, oh, well, why don't you just, uh, hey, your life's shitty. Why don't you just be the fantasy character now? Hey, it's yeah. not so bad, man. Right. You're just the fantasy yeah. character now. It's just the start of your new life. Yeah. As a, a, a carnal warlord mm -hmm. of the post-apocalyptic wasteland. So when, you know, you walk by someone who is blowing their brains out completely unflinching, you don't have to read into what the movie's saying. You know exactly where they were going with that. Right. So now we have uh, a filmmaker we've seen before, filmmaker we've covered before, and a filmmaker we're still terrified of. Yeah, still not ready. When <laughs> crash happens, not yeah, ready. I know. I, that was a moment for... I had never seen this. Oh, really? Um, and oh, wow. I, I thought I got Cronenberg because I've seen all the body horror. See, I told you there was a weird sex thing yeah. we were avoiding because it's too weird and I don't know how to and, talk about it. And I've it. seen all three of the ones that... Um, get all the awards the sure. newer ones sure. the we totally got a handle Mortensen on those, those trilogy. Great. yeah right <laughs> um and, and uh, they're great too and this was a complete i mean it's so cronenberg it's almost too cronenberg you know what i mean <laughs> right um well because you have no handle on it right. that's what makes and it and you get this thing that i just realized watching the credits where it says you know based on a novel or um, <laughs> right. from the story by, and then it says, immediately following, it will say, say hypothetically, based on the novel, The Little Engine That Could by so-and-so. <laughs> right. And then it will say, immediately following, 
written by David Cronenberg. Sure. Yeah. And that's the moment yeah. where you go, oh, so okay. Yeah. <laughs> when it says written by David Cronenberg, that's when you know that it's not based on that novel. Right. <laughs> that somebody somewhere along the line went, this is kind of like the little engine that could. <laughs> you think? No, you I don't, I don't totally actually backwards. think that. But sure. I think that David Cronenberg does these twists and i mean twists because sure. they're twisted yeah these twists on novelizations that he writes them in a way that he knows he can tackle in the most subversive sure and fucked up ways that he because he prances in that territory that's sure. where he lives and he gets all these fucking actors that you never expect to do a decent job with few exceptions i mean peter weller love yeah. peter weller we've talked about all well we think these guys can do a decent job yeah. because they've been in the cronenberg movies. yeah that's yeah that's exactly what it is peter it's weller kind of is a... robocop yeah and had i not seen any of his other stuff i would go oh yeah robocop yeah you but know he was whatever also Buckaroo Banzai. well yeah but that's what i mean <laughs> no <laughs> i know that's exactly what you mean <laughs> But then, uh, you know, Mortensen, too, didn't care about him until uh -huh. I started seeing him in the Cronenberg Hidalgo. stuff. And then I suddenly thought, oh, best actor ever. You yep. know, that's the kind of thing that ha Jeff Goldblum, I didn't consider anything more than, oh, a person I enjoy. Uh -huh. And then The Fly happened. Right. And it was, wow, Jeff Goldblum can do things. Yeah. Or let's say, I don't know, one of the uh, non-walk-in actors from The Prophecy. <laughs> sure. sure. Not right. Christopher Walken, not Virginia Madsen. Sure. Can that guy act? Yeah, right, right. So I wanted to do Crash after Bellflower because Bellflower does such a good job of going, hey, you probably brought all of these things together in your head and really understood what we were doing, and I'm going to solidify that, pat you on the back, and go, yes, this is what we were doing here. Now everybody gets it, and we're just, filmmakers do a phenomenal job, audience does a phenomenal yeah. job. Go team. And then Crash happens, yeah. and usually I watch Crash, and I go, man, I, I understand that even less than last time yep. that shit happened. And so I think we can tackle it this time, and I'm just, you know, I'm just littered with questions. Yeah. The place I want to start is James Spader. James Spader. Because we've seen him in Secretary, Very where sexy other in Secretary. weird sex stuff happened. And yeah. I mean, James he Spader- He was also in shorts. He was. He was Mr. Black, right? <laughs> Yeah, the um the other place he's really well known for though is uh Sex Lies and Videotape. Right. So I mean he's had a lot of these roles where he's he does always, brooding sexy art films. Even That's his character his in thing. the office is really sexually charged <laughs> sure. in a fucked up way. Sure, right. Yeah, James Spader has this weird thing with sex where it's and it's not just this film, but it's especially in this film, where James Spader and sex is really intense. Sure. Primal, visceral. It's it's like a need, an urge. Sure. And you question whether he enjoys it at all. Sure. You don't know whether he's fucking because his cock is hungry. Sure. Or because he wants to have an orgasm. Yeah, I've known people, too, who make really sexual-fueled art, and they cannot provide any insight for me about <laughs> it. It's one of those things, I think it's it's just that it's what it is because it's so visceral. Uh -huh. I mean, it's sex. Yeah. How, how more visceral do you yeah. get than... You know, it's uh, maybe it's all about a mood and nothing about an explanation. Yeah. I want a pretentious artsy metaphor, but it's just weird, dark sex. Sure. You look at James Spader's career and he's attracted to those roles. You see something like Crash and I mean, this is, uh, you know, I also think about James Spader because when I think about Cronenberg stuff, I think he has the same actor in all his movies and he doesn't. Yeah. Peter Weller in a Cronenberg movie is the same guy in my head as James Spader. You know, he's the same guy as James Woods. Uh -huh. You know, this totally. is the same actor who's in Videodrome. And you see these movies, and they are very different people, but I see this same kind of tranquil, I'm okay with the fucked up thing that's happening in front mm -hmm. of me, and even with the Viggo Mortensen stuff, um, to the point where... I don't think about, oh, this actor stands out as my ally in this movie. Instead, he's just a part of the Cronenberg landscape of these weird yeah. projects he's doing. And I think that's why, you know, in my head I have trouble. If you ask me which one is James Woods in, I go, oh, he's in all of them. Yeah. He's in the, I don't know, James he's in Woods, Naked oh, Lunch, the, right? the Cronenberg movie? Yeah, yeah. he's in the Cronenberg <laughs> right. movie. The one that has James Spader in it is the one where... History of Violence. Yeah. Is James right? Spader in the TV? He's in The Brood. Yeah. I don't know which right? one. You know, I have this problem with him. And I think the only definitive one is Jeff Goldblum is the fly. That's, <laughs> right. That's what you get. Right. But the performance you're getting out of Jeff Goldblum is kind of similar no, to right. the other ones. You're right. You know, so when Cronenberg writes these parts, 
uh, he gets these actors to play him and they do this perfect job of, I mean, you really know you're watching a role that Cronenberg intended more so than just a role that, well, this is how James Spader performs in this role. Although you then see James Spader in secretary sure. and you also go weird kind of docile sexuality. So at one point that kind of informs it because I can go, okay, James Spader from Secretary. I kind of got Secretary. I'm getting this. Sure. But at the same time, it also goes, this is not going to help you at all. Right. This person is not going to be your ally in this thing. And I mean, I say that because, all right, we're looking at this movie Crash. This is about this kind of, I guess, underground world of car crash sexuality. Right. right? That's a weird place to be in. And all the characters exist in that world. So in my head, I'm going crazy sci-fi world. Uh -huh. That's what David Cronenberg does. I'm looking for an ally. That's why I keep using the word ally. Yeah. I'm looking for the kind of straight man outsider who's first being introduced to this. James Spader's character is that guy. Right. But he's so okay with it, he doesn't help me at all. Right. Well, <laughs> you know and what that's, I mean? that, yeah. He's not the one who's going to explain this to you. Sure. He's not the guy going, wow, everyone, this is, this is the same thing we talked about Naked Lunch. Yeah. All this weird shit's happening. Yeah. And the outsider character isn't going, yeah. wow, you guys, hold on. This is so weird. I need to stop and talk yeah. about it. He's just going, oh, Further down sexy, the rabbit hole. sexy car. Cra this is, this is yeah. what I've been doing my whole life. I didn't know there was a community for this. Right. And that's the terrifying moment where you realize David Cronenberg is moving out of sci-fi and into the real world and <laughs> right? you need to run away. Yeah. Yeah, as if his warped, you know, when it was sci-fi territory, it was okay. Because yeah. I don't exist in the world right. of Videodrome. Sure. That's fine. Um, the same kind of weird underground thing, too, in uh -huh. Videodrome. A lot of those uh, same motifs. But when it's happening here, I don't have to think, oh, no, long live the new flesh. What if that actually happened? Right. Wouldn't that be crazy? This might actually exist somewhere. Sure. And I'm, it's freaking me out. Well, I mean, it even makes plays on historical reality. They sure. talk about sure. James Dean. Sure. And that's the moment where, I mean. They try and make it more real. Yeah. They bring you, they, instead of doing the uh the fly thing instead of doing i mean naked lunch does it exceptionally instead of trying really hard to bring you into their world they're doing it's it's like mental 3d right sure, sure. it's coming into your world and you're right. terrified because by the end of the film you go oh my god this is just in california <laughs> sure this is <laughs> sure this isn't in some other universe on some other planet this is a thousand miles from where i live or further or close i don't know where people are living these days i just assume everyone lives in chicago um definitely not the case yeah our listenership proves it it's a place where you have i mean on the opposite end of things you have the crazy super immersed character like uh elias cotis's character right who we've seen um, in the prophecy and the fourth kind and at pupil gattaca as gattaca. well uh and you're gattaca right. as well I mean, it's a character, you're kind of afraid of him because he's so immersed and it's a little scary how mm -hmm. crazy he is. He's, um, you know, he would be playing our Michael Ironside doppelganger sure, in right. this movie as as the other ones. Well, and he's he's the type of person in this film where he's he's got an explanation that he gives for why he does what he does to see if people are ready for the real explanation. Sure. <laughs> I mean, he is that involved. Yep. He knows how fucked up it is. It's ten layers deep. In yeah, this. it's absolutely a level of insanity it's a level of insanity that brings you back to being functional Sure, because you need a moment to stop and go well the film kind of knows that i'm not okay with this right if none of the characters in the film know at least the film you know uh, james is the fresh perspective but we can't identify with him but he's still a good vantage point for our world he's mm -hmm. a good guide so i feel like um while the world is completely unknown and off-putting this is at least a person showing us around that place, but definitely not someone we could see ourselves as. Right. Or maybe we could. Yeah. I mean, so here's the thing. I'm making this sound like all the Cronenberg movies are the same, and they all have the Michael Ironside guy, and they all have the weird sexy thing, and or I guess some weird thing that might stand in where the sexuality does, and they don't. No. They're not the same movie. But I'm doing the movie a disservice because as we're talking about it, I'm trying to just desperately cling on to the elements that, that I kind of get. Know, which are that you've seen other David Cronenberg sure. movies. Can we do something really uncomfortable for the show? Huh. Let's just go the other direction. Okay. Let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I want to ask you a bunch of questions about this movie. Great. And my answer for every question is I have no idea. All right. So uh, we'll just talk about the weird things in the yeah. movie. First fucking thing I want to know, and this may be the hardest question, but one I think is well-deserved. This is a movie about people who are turned on by car crashes. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of sexuality in the movie. There's a lot of fucking. There's a lot of nudity. 
It starts There's, with nudity and you know, fucking. A woman's and rubbing her boob on an airplane. Yeah. I mean, is this hot? I don't know if this is hot. You know, I think, and I, I know it's almost to the point on double feature where it feels like an easy answer, but <laughs> I'm gonna go back to a dirty shame. Okay, I'm going the antithesis to antithesis of David Cronenberg. I'm, yeah, I'm going to invoke a dirty shame, and I'm going to say people are into everything. And it's okay. And somebody's as long into airplane boob rubbing. People are into everything. Someone's tried it. That's, you know, sure. people are into okay. everything. Someone's tried it and it's fine. Sure. As long as it's safe, consensual, and nobody's getting hurt. I guess I agree with all of those yeah. things. See, this is the, the weird thing I'm having. And maybe uh, this is going back to talking about that visceral nature. I'm seeing a woman rub her boob on this airplane. And I think it's kind of turning me on, but I'm yeah. not, I don't know if I'm turned on. That's how, how yeah. much this movie's fucking I, with me I, I is agree. I'm watching it and I can't really, as if I can make a decision, you know, sure. you see things and they turn you on or they don't, Right. but I'm watching crash and I can't tell if I'm aroused or not. It's absolutely amazing that an <laughs> entire like... film can go from start to finish and you never know if you're turned on. Okay. So this is at least an emotion you can identify with here. Well, no, I don't know if I, I was having a unique experience I don't or not. Say, yeah. I don't want to say it's an emotion I can identify with <laughs> Okay, because sure. it's the first time I think it's ever really happened to me yeah, where weird. a film is this, it's so sexually charged sure. from the get go. But you don't know if it's sexy or not. Right. You yeah. know that it's sex. And I think that is really the only definitive thing I can say is that Crash is sex, though maybe not sexy. I mean, it's dark and brooding. That's certainly one of the things about the sexuality yeah. is it's a lot uh, fucking darker than it's not the fun time John yeah. Waters. So, yeah. so it's certainly not fun time right. sexuality. We can definitely say that about it. But I'm wondering how, you know, the reason I even bring up this question is I want to know how the audience is supposed to interpret the sexuality. Sure. When you see this, I mean, let's contrast this to, uh, we watch Bound for uh -huh. the show. Bound is a movie I watch, and it also borders on pornography in the same way this does. Yeah. And I mean that in the best way possible, yep. in the most uh, artistically redeeming way possible. But I watch Bound, and I go, this is hot. You know, it's fine. That's just a fine thing that happens in the first half of Bound, and I get why the movie's doing it, but also it's totally fine if the audience watches it and they think it's hot. That yeah, is part of absolutely. the intention there. Sure. You're supposed to believe the characters think it's hot. I mean, we, we yeah. defended that on the uh -huh. show. I watch Crash and it's still dark. It's still moody in mm -hmm. a lot of the ways that Bound was kind of dark and moody. And it's still just as, uh, I keep going back to the word pornographic. Because yeah. It has naked people doing yeah. it. That's fine. But it was way more fun there. Why is it so different here? I think because the that one was easy for me <laughs> yeah i think it's because the characters in the story are so deeply psychologically invested in what's going on sure there's this this kind of thing that we always cover on double feature with the sex which is that sex is sex and it's not the same i mean fucking is fucking and it doesn't necessarily have to be more than that sure it can be fun it can be enjoyable it can mean a lot or it can mean nothing sure and i think there isn't necessarily a magic associated with right, it or, but or I, that needs to be attached. To yeah, it. exactly. And I think in Crash, there's so much self-discovery that goes along sure. with every bit of intercourse. You're right. Anytime it's self anybody's fucking anyone, they're learning ways <laughs> about themselves sure, sure. and really becoming immersed, not only like in that person, but it, they're almost, it's like they're fucking themselves sure right they're gaining so much more of a psychological awareness sure. every time they fuck anybody and everybody fucks everybody sure right i mean if you look at it like gaining knowledge per person you fuck <laughs> right these are the four smartest they're racking people. up experience yeah. that's what they're doing yeah and I mean, they go for it. They always go for it. Maybe it's their lack of hesitation. Sure. That's part of what, what separates me from that world and makes it, I don't want to call it off-putting, but I mean, I think that's probably yeah. intention. You know, he has a car crash with the, the girl he ends up meeting right. through the crash. You know, in a lot of ways, that's weirder than the science fiction kind of stuff. Yeah. He looks over at the other girl after this car crash, bodies flying around or whatever, and she rips open her shirt and presumably starts masturbating. Yeah. I mean, it's this kind of thing where it doesn't really get much weirder than that. You know, when you crash a fucking car, you're thinking about who's to blame, damage to the vehicle, uh, safety, destruction, insurance, police, ambulance. None of these are concerns these characters yeah. have. Does not address one of these fucking things. 
They don't, you know, get out of the car and talk about how hurt they are. How hurt they are only ever comes into play when you think about kind of that body horror thing. Yeah. When you look at their scars as weird human oddities and then poke them and then rub your hands on them and touch them and then start masturbating. Yeah. The only time you even think about damage. Uh Uh-huh. Other than that, every bit of, you know, the crashes is sexuality. No time to consider what normal people consider, only time to think about sex stuff. And I think that's enough to go, Cronenberg probably knows most of the audience isn't into this. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're at the point in figuring out Cronenberg where it would not surprise me if he, if if this was a big surprise to him, that the audience wasn't all into this and thought it was hot. You know, I could go either way on this. Yeah. And one thing I can definitely say, and I'm not trying to say we're, again, not trying to say we're particularly unique individuals, but if we're not into it, most people are not into it. Well, at the very least, or at least if we can't see the appeal, sure. Let's put it that way. We were just talking about exploitation last show. Yeah. I mean, we kind of get the, whether it's true or not. And in a lot of cases, not true. I get the Weinstein brother kind of sitting in the chair, smoking a cigar, going, what puts asses into seats? You know what I mean? I I understand that concept. And I feel like most people see this, and this isn't a putting asses into seats kind of thing. It's an oddity kind of thing. Yeah. I just don't know. Does Cronenberg know that? He knows that, right? I think David Cronenberg Does he not care? I think he lives in in this world of self-exploration i think sure every time he makes art especially something like crash Mm -hmm. he's trying to do something original in a sense that you have never thought about that before well and 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 just really quick to clarify yeah i'm not saying that hey cronenberg should wake up and realize if there was a machine gun for a leg he'd sell more tickets no i think i think i I just i just want to know if you know he makes the movie he makes which is exactly the movie he should make And this is not an exploitation movie that appeals to whatever. That's not the goal here. Yeah. And I get that. My question is more when he makes this movie, does he even stop to go, oh, yeah, people think this is fucking weird. Or does he just make a movie that he goes home and masturbates to? I just don't know the answer. Yeah, I think I think that a lot of it has to be this kind of person. I think he's making films that. That are that are probing and thought provoking to him, right? Which are ten times removed to what's probing and thought provoking to <laughs> okay. an average person. Okay, I see what you mean. He's watching the film and going, "Ah, yes, this does deal with a lot of issues in society." Sure. And we're watching the film, going, "Oh my fucking Christ!" Yeah. Well, what the, is this guy thinking? The thing that makes his movie so amazing and makes him such a, I mean, a filmmaker. I'm so fucking interested in is his ability to stay in a world and to commit to it and never to stop to go, oh, normal person's perspective, aren't they going to think this is weird? Yeah. You know what I mean? Even when we think about other things like The Fly, I mean, that's the one that I think is one of the most, oh my God, someone has turned into a fly. Uh But even then, not, not that much. Right. You know, and so the fact that he doesn't stop to give outsider perspective, yeah, he just dives into that world because... Because he's comfortable. Yeah. He's, he just, he's comfortable with his vision and he's sure. comfortable with his mind. Sure. And that's something that I think a lot of filmmakers end up grappling with. Right. Is going, how do I put my mind and my vision into sure. the eyes of people who will understand it? Sure. How do I create a back door into my right. brain? Right. And David Cronomer goes, my brain doesn't have a back door. You have <laughs> right. to come in the front door. And yeah. in order to get to the front door, you have to walk through the front yard. And the front yard is a bunch of dildos. Sure. Well, if I could use your metaphor uh, even more here, there's no uh, moat with a bridge over it here. Yeah. There is no, oh, welcome, welcome in. I realize that this is different from the outside sure. world. Uh, why don't you come in and explore? He's the, he lives two houses down from you, except it's instead of family. grass. Yeah, that's, <laughs> perfect. That's exactly it. Like not even aware. The, I mean, you know, they go to the car dealership. That's a point where maybe the guy at the dealership is nowhere near the world of sexuality. He just sells sure. cars, but he even seems a little turned on by it. Sure. You know? Well, it's a woman. Uh, I mean, yeah, sure. That's, I think that's kind of the thing there is that, but that's the closest she comes in and get, she's, yeah. You know, to saying, oh yeah, they're to an acknowledgement of the outside world. Right. That's what I'm saying. You don't have, and it's amazing yeah. for that. I'm and, not well, saying it's missing something. Yeah, I'm saying but, that's. That's and, the beauty. And here. I think that it's I think that it's a double edged sword when he does that because he brings it in and here comes the moment where the outside world can look in 
and she's sexually appealing at that moment. Sure. Any guy would have had the same reaction. I see her in that moment sure. and go, oh, she's being really hot right sure. now. And so instead of you seeing the real world creep in, you see the crash world creep out. Right. You right. see where it can gel with normal society. Yeah. You see, you know, the Venn diagram of normalcy and crazy crash people are that car dealer. Right. He's right. he's turned on by this car, this woman sure. in a car. I mean, and that's the moment where you go blondes and muscle cars. Right. Okay. It starts there. <laughs> right. That is the crossover. That's point. the slippery slope yeah. to uh, to this underground society. Yeah, I mean, I think that scene is the the closest thing to him showing his hand yeah. as to whether or not he's almost in a piece of performance himself as a director, as just going, uh, outside world, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Yeah. And I love that because this isn't just places other people don't go in their movie. This is, uh, I mean, he goes places you didn't even know you could go because he's so willing to push it this far and to stay in this world. And it's an amazing thing to do because... When you address something like this in a movie, if you have a character that plays it a little straight, then you're wasting time bridging with the audience, where instead you have this kind of closed system that can then, it's a movie, it's documented and printed, and you can look in on it anytime you want. So if me and you want to answer these questions, we just watch Crash a thousand times, right. you know what I mean? And then we figure out, you know, we, we kind of get these answers rather than having a character hold our hand through it and help us explore the world. Yeah. He just goes, here's the world. You can look at the world whenever you want. You can come into the world. You can play around in the world. I'm never going to tell you anything about yeah. it. You're just invited here and, you know, maybe you'll figure it out or maybe maybe you'll just watch this movie so many times that the car wash scene will turn you on. I think that would be my gateway into uh -huh. this. And then before you know it, you'll be one of the crash people yeah. and never have realized that that transition yeah. even, even fucking happened. Ah, David Cronenberg, so fucking good. Um, we have a, a website, I guess. I don't care. What are we doing next time? People know the thing, right? Go to the website, yeah, website find the other David Cronenberg movies. Email more Cronenberg. Next so time. Easy, next so time. easy. So easy. Bad Cat. I get Bad Cat. That's on the website. Yeah. Uh, next also, time on the show. Also, coincidentally, directed by David Cronenberg. Oh. Um, Double feature show at gmail.com. All right, so uh, next week we're gonna get a we're gonna get what rock and roll. We're gonna get fucking heavy metal. On Let's this get shit. more accessible. All Back right. towards yeah. the accessibility. Right. Sounds good. Um, little accessible, little camp, little cult. We're gonna do rock and roll high school, the Ramones movie. Great. And then uh, this is Spinal Tap. Let's just go ahead and watch those right now. All right, watch more fucking film. Bye.